it's all good. And um, I agree. I think we should feel free to ramble. So that is that is one of our skills and talents. Okay. So, you know, like that's a, that's a strength. It's a, it's, a, right. it's a feature, not a bug, right? So right. Um, it's a I've, not a bug. I've had like occasions in class where you know I, I come in with a lesson plan and there's and just something occurs to me right in the process and then like there's this moment of spark where I can suddenly make yeah. connections with like five other things over the course of the semester plus three things that are happening and you know, current world yep. events and it's like the yeah. best moment of class and I can't reproduce them and I can't plan yeah. them. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, yeah. okay, so uh, introductions, introductions, we should introduce ourselves. So Benjamin That's Rosenbaum good. is going to introduce himself rather than me doing it. <laughs> so, I could. But you but... would do it so capably. <laughs> um, I think it would also be funny if we introduced each other. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. It's hard to know where to start with oneself. So I, uh, um, my name is Benjamin Rosenbaum. I am a dad and writer and computer programmer and rugby flanker. Not anymore. Not anymore. I stopped playing rugby. And um, uh, <laughs> I think it would actually be good to it would sort of be good to introduce ourselves by way of telling how we met because that sort of yeah. works, doesn't it? Yeah. No, I um, think so. So I, I wanted to be a science fiction writer when I grew up, um, when I was little. I mean, I think I wanted to be a superhero and an alien and a science fiction writer, but eventually that seemed like the most plausible option of the three. And, um, and uh, then I stopped abruptly in college, which we could talk about sometimes, it's a good story. And then I decided to start again. And when I was, so when I was like 29, or 30. Oh, and I was I think I was 30 when I went to Clarion West, which is one of the couple or three strange little paraliterary science fiction boot camps, what which year sort was of that? exists 2001, 2001, which is when we met. Um, and it, it, which is one of the couple of little strange little parallel paraliterary boot camps that sort of exists outside of academia. Like it's kind of like academia, except not, and it's, it's compressed into six weeks. There's no, there's no status that translates to the outside academic world, as far as I know, maybe there is now, not in 2001. And, and, uh, and yet all, like, all these luminaries of science fiction like jump at the chance to come and teach like a week. Like I would, I would love to teach Clarion. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, you, know, you, you apply to get in and you get in, and that's where I met you because I was at Clarion and you came to talk about a, uh, a webzine you had just launched, Strange Horizons. That's right. Now, I think. Yeah, yeah no, that's, no, no, that's absolutely right. So if 2001, so. that's, um, yeah, and that was really, it was just very random. I can't remember, <laughs> you know, I wasn't teaching at Clarion uh, that year. I was just, I think I must have just been visiting Seattle. You were at the Seattle one, right? And yeah. Um, I think I just dropped them a note and said, hey, I'm in town, would love to come by and talk to the students if they're around. Was there a, conf was there a, a convention happening? Was I there for Westercon maybe? I don't know. Or I don't remember there being. Certainly we didn't go. The, you didn't go I, You would go. think they would have dragged all the little clarion kids. I think you were just in town. But it seemed like you were drumming up, you know, submitters to well, your yes. new project, yes. right? Yes. Uh, so, a, you know. Anyway, you were a special guest. It was very, you, you, were, you were an impresario. And, um, and, and this, by way of, you know, introducing you, this was like, not the first um, genre transforming volunteer uh, foundation that you created, nor would it be the last. <laughs> but it was, it was your first, it was, it was your first encounter of, with Which is now me. one of the yeah. longest running. I know. Uh, yeah. No, I'm saying, but it was definitely my first encounter with you, but I just mean, I encountered you as someone who was, you know, this, like, you're, you're an impresario. You had, mm. <laughs> you had, not only were you in the process of creating out of nothing uh, a, a new market, which would go on to be the longest running, probably the longest running web, web thing. And, and, and in those days, too, that was like, yeah. it was like one of the very first, like the third or fourth sort of, we are a online magazine, which publishes stories online. That was very bizarre yeah. and sexy and threatening in 2001. And, and. Um, People got mad at us. And. So. Uh, yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was out there. Anyone could just print it, and yeah. then they'd have it, and they wouldn't have to pay for another copy. It was terrible. Well, and, and, anyway, you know, so <laughs> we also we had no um, 
we, we knew that we wanted to pay the writers, but we were not thinking about yeah. paying for any of the other yeah. work that goes into the magazine. And I think I had a really, like in retrospect, I, I understand why the print magazine people were kind of mad at us because we were like, we're just yeah. going to ignore this entire aspect of the economy and volunteer our labor. And we were in some sense scabbing, right? We were like we were undercutting yeah. the yeah. jobs. Sure. As well. Anyway. So then we got to know each other as writers and um, hangers out at Wis hanger outers at Wisconsin, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yes. So yes, I went to Clarion and then I published a whole bunch of stories and I've written role playing games and I okay. don't know. I I'm gonna I'll, I'll add a, I'll add a couple other things to your bio just because yeah. they interest me. I lo I love that you introduced yourself as a dad first because. Um, you know, I do a identity exercise with my students sometimes where uh, as part of uh, building characters, asking them to think through their own identities and what's important to them. And uh, one of, and so people will put down all kinds of things, like maybe you are primarily a, an, a, an urban person. I'm a city girl and that's like super important to my identity or um, I'm mm -hmm. Sri Lankan, but maybe I identify mostly as Tamil because that ethnic identity is more important to me than the nationalistic one or vice versa, right? So um, maybe gender is important to me, maybe sexual orientation, et cetera. But one of the things that's interesting about doing in, in a class of say 30 freshmen is you see some trends. And one of the trends is that the women in the class mostly have a relational aspect as one of their huh. identifiers. So early on in their list, huh. if I ask them to list like, what are the five most important things about you? They will often yeah. have things like, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm, if I have older students, I'm a wife, I'm a mother. Um, and the men almost yeah. never li list that, even if they are also husbands and fathers and so on, right? Um, sure. And presumably they are sons. So. I think that's an interesting thing about you. I think the the fact that you um, do put that front and center, and in fact, like you think about parenting and fatherhood and children and raising children pretty intensely, and uh, so that's been one of the topics that we've you and I have talked about a lot. In part because yeah. you married a Swiss girl and live in Switzerland a lot of the time, even though you are from America, and mm -hmm. so there's a lot of. Yeah culture -y stuff that goes into raising of kids and um yeah. and you had you had your kids a few years before me so especially early on um i was asking for advice a lot <laughs> I, and i still remember some of the things you you told me about like letting them you know touch the stove because uh, they're gonna they, if they don't listen <laughs> to you i literally said let them touch the stove <laughs> i'm pretty sure you did i think that, you that said that you extreme example <laughs> <laughs> you said that you I would think I said let them fall off things. No, no, it was the stove. I remember this very distinctly because I was a little shocked, right? You said, but you said you would warn them. You'd warn them that the stove is hot and they're going to burn themselves. But if they persist in reaching out to touch it anyway, you would sort of stand there and be like, it's hot. Well, You're going to burn maybe yourself. Maybe like a pot on the stove. I mean, I, I would say there's a, I would say yeah. there's a, there's a, well, because my whole thing about this, and this is diverging from introductions, but my That's whole thing okay. about this is the distinction, the distinction between pain and damage, right? Right, like, so right. No, and you did talk about that. Yeah. Between, yeah, and so. With, I'm not saying you like, touch no, you, the I burner. I let a kid touch a burner that's on six. Right, right, not the burner. that might be like a scar forever. Right. But like a pot that's like simmering, sure. Like, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah, yeah. it's gonna, that's gonna hurt. You're right. Yeah, I, I'm definitely, a, yeah, I mean, I think that is like, it, and I think there's something there where it's like, if you are, if you, you will drive yourself crazy as a parent trying to protect your kids from pain. And I, you know right. what I mean? I mean, like, yeah. you're, that's your impulse. Your impulse is to protect them from all pain. Not, you know, falling off thing, the couch or touching mm -hmm. a hot pan or like, you know, going out with the wrong person. Like, you know, like, the, like whatever, like right. being friends with, and, and that, um, and you can't, you can't actually protect them from pain. And in fact, it's far more useful for you to be an ally, a reliable <laughs> ally. So if you're like, if your track record is like, I don't think you should do that, it will hurt. And then you let them and they die, you know, then they're like, you know, that's, that's. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's dad just, knows what he's know, talking you're, about. You're a reliable. And if you're, and the other side of that is if you're not like, you may not do that because I'm afraid it will hurt you. 
Like you have to be, for them to trust you, you have to be willing to be, you may not do that. I am not, I'm forbidding you because it will damage you. Like that's right. a backstop. Like they want your, their parents to be like, you may not do things that will damage you. But right. if they know that you're going to stop them from doing things that will just hurt but not damage them, they're not going to tell you about those things. You know what right. I mean? They're just going to go do them. And they are, you know, you are deprived of the opportunity for oversight and they're deprived of your wise counsel. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's a hard muscle to develop to be like, that's a bad idea. Let's, let's, you know, but I'm here for you. Like, <laughs> so that's an anyway, example. That's one of the like great. little parenting lessons discussions that we had early on that I think was pretty, pretty interesting to me. And then there's a bunch more, but we'll, we'll save those for, for later episodes. We have to come back to the whole thing about like yeah, yeah. walking on the road and getting hit by cars, but, but we'll come back to that. I'm also, <laughs> oh, that's, I want to hear about that too. I do not remember advising you to let your kids get hit by cars. I, I, um, <laughs> I, I am a synagogue pre, uh, co board member. Well, I was going to come to that. I was going to say the other, the other main thing yeah. that I would pull out, aside from you being a science fiction writer and, and are talking about that a lot, is that because you are so deeply involved with your synagogue, I think yeah. um, religion and community management, community, I don't know if management is yeah. the word, but, um, but thinking, yeah. thinking through how to enhance your community and support people within it is a big part of what you do and it's a big part of what I do in different ways and so um, yeah you know what, what is the term for what you do your yeah. is there a technical term or are you uh, a goodbye I mean <laughs> well I don't know no, like, like I was not raised I'm, right. not, I'm not religious but I was raised Catholic and I'm trying to like remember what yeah, the term yeah. is but there's a term for not a priest but a lay person who uh, is right right like a deacon uh, or something I think deacon yeah. might be the term right? I mean that's so. Yes, right. That's a, that's a pretty goyish term. I, <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't apply to me, therefore. Okay. Um, it, yeah. I mean, synagogue board member is a relatively new institution, right? It's it's. Okay. An, I mean, it's yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. In the last few centuries, so so. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I'm also a goodbye, which means I call people up for the Torah, but that's like a very small. Like, okay. there's there are traditional Hebrew names for some aspects of what I, what I sometimes do, but it's. Uh, but 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 those, you know, you know, uh, really, it's a. It's it's very interesting because it's a very ancient religion and it's also sort of a very modern demo, democratic, very Swiss institution. Like being, you know, this is just very definitely bylaws and the Swiss care a lot about bylaws and electing officers and having. Uh, and there, there's a very important every every Swiss uh, person to the first approximation is in a is in a Verein, like is in mm -hmm. a club, and and the clubs in Switzerland, like if you have four guys who play basketball every Wednesday night, they will elect a president, a secretary, a treasurer, and a, and a, and a vice president and, and have a, you know, as soon as there's money, as soon as they rent a basketball. And then they have an annual meeting. And at the annual meeting, the, the people have to discharge. They have to formally discharge the board of their duties of the prior year. And then yeah. only then may you proceed to the next <laughs> Anyway, so uh, I don't know why I'm telling you that, but it's 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 funny because it's it's on the border between democracy and uh, it's a democratic institution, which is an interesting aspect. That is I've interesting. learned a lot about democracy being a synagogue board member. Yeah. Um, yeah, but also Judaism plays a big role in my fiction, particularly lately. I mean, I think it was more oblique in the beginning, and it's become more and more overt as time goes on. <laughs> yeah, I think so, and I'm not. As I said, I'm not religious, but I think a lot about, um, hmm, I don't know. I don't, it's, it's almost like I, I wish I were religious and, um, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I, I, I had that moment in Catholic school in seventh grade where I was arguing with my teacher about this and she was sort of saying, you have to just take the leap of faith. And I was like, I do not think I can do that. So like, this is a, you know, and uh, Judaism does not require the same leap of faith that Catholicism yeah. asks of you. So um, maybe I could be a good Jew. I don't know. Um, but... <laughs> I do sometimes feel a little sorry for some of the Goyim because it's kind of like you apparently, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm just observing this from the outside, but you apparently have to like take a position on God you do. before yeah. you get to do the whole Catholicism thing, which seems like a shame because there's lots <laughs> of fun stuff in Catholicism. Stained glass windows and organs and robes and, you know, why do you have to take a position on God in order to get all the fun stuff? That, that seems... I mean, you could still
still go to church. It's not, it's not like you can't go to church, but you can go to church and be, <laughs> and be, uh, be apostate. I'm not sure. I yeah, like now yeah. I'm talking about things that I really don't know anything about. So well, I don't, well, <laughs> I don't, I don't actually, I don't actually, I, I mean, I don't, I mean, you know, I, I identify as a sort of postmodern theist. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it, it really depends on the day and, and my position on it is very, uh, fluid and weird but but certainly like it's very most of the people in my synagogue are atheists i mean and, and my kids who are extremely active and like lead programs and teach about you know mm -hmm. teach sunday school and uh, are both i think atheists well i don't know noah's and noah's i believe agnostic it might be unfair to say that they're atheists but certainly they well and i, and I would call myself a strong agnostic there's a there's yeah. a thing in um <laughs> there used to be this woman who came to conventions who I don't remember her name. We called her the button lady. And she had um, all <laughs> these, you know, thousands of buttons that she would sell, many of which were quite funny. And she had some that were um, strong agnostic was... What was it? it was like I don't know and you don't either, <laughs> which and then uh, <laughs> right and then uh, nice. you know like and weak agnostic was I don't know and I don't care and, uh, uh -huh, and, uh -huh. and at one point I postulated uh, and she actually made this into a button and occasionally I see nice. people wearing it conventions relaxed bisexual agnostic I don't know I don't care and maybe I'll sleep with it um, <laughs> which is, I think of as like the Captain Jack version of religion right so right right uh, yeah, yeah I mean so, that's, there's some to be said for that yeah the, <laughs> but, the um no no it's an agnostic with an eye mm -hmm. so there's an agnostic with an eye apparently i don't know is, what that is, is yeah. to say that he thinks it's wrong it means it's the wrong question like i think mm -hmm. i think the button would say like strong agnostic that's not even a thing right yeah <laughs> interesting <laughs> so <laughs> all right so anyway and i think i actually got the the stick right it was strong agnostic i don't know and you don't either I don't remember what weak agnostic is. It's relaxed agnostic was I don't know and I don't care. But oh, okay. um, cool. anyway, leaving the buttons aside, the <laughs> let me do let me do my intro because I think it'll yeah. it'll then tie into all of this stuff. So um, I was born in Sri Lanka. I came to the U.S. when I was two. This is not going to be a super long intro, even though I started with my birth. Um, it can and, be. It can be. I know, but you know that it's then it's like what is that novel that starts with the the, the really long <laughs> early English novel? I should know this. They're gonna like take away my PhD. Um, it starts with the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picturing the, the the pulling up outside your your house in a black SUV with the, like the PhD taker away. Or... Well, there's this moment in there's this moment in uh, in one of the David Lodge novels where there there's a bunch of so David Lodge is a comedian who comedy writer who writes about academia. They're very funny. Uh, one of his novels is Small World, where they are um, it's a bunch of academics on convention going to conventions. So they're flying all the what yep. we cannot do right now in the age of coronavirus, but they're flying around the world to conventions uh, in order to get laid basically so it's all about the bed hopping uh -huh. of the professors <laughs> and it's a very funny book and there's a moment where they're all sitting in a hotel room playing a drinking game called shame um, where they have to say like I've never read Grapes of Wrath and everyone who has it takes a drink right and so you know I've never read blah 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 so all of these right. tenured faculty right and um, yeah, 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 and yeah. then in the, in the, it's a very funny I'm mean, going to spoil this moment in the book because what happens is you know some they go around and then someone's like I've never read Hamlet and everyone just goes oh, you know and like the game is over <laughs> he's destroyed his career in academia you like lost. this is the one the thing the game is over you, you, just, can't, you yeah. can't admit that you know like uh, uh, so uh, anyway I have, I have read Hamlet but I can't is it, is it, it's not Tom Jones is it I'm really, it's a, is it the the novel that's really long that sometimes called the first novel that starts with the guy being born it might be Tom Jones oh, I can't remember or, I should I should look anyway. it up but well and it's yeah. and it and I think Rushdie uses that somewhat as a model mm. farcical referent mm. to with Midnight's yeah. Children because he starts with this whole thing about the birth of his protagonist with the huge nose and yeah. it goes from there anyway yeah this is not that <laughs> This okay. will not end up being the longest novel in the English language, as I tell you my biography. But um, I grew up in Connecticut, avid 
genre reader, you know, like I'd search out the books with the rocket ships and the dragons on the spines at the library. My dad would Amen. often, yeah, would like drop me at the library on Saturday morning. I would sit there and read for like eight hours straight, come home with 20 books, be done with them by Wednesday. Um, this was during the summer when I had nothing to do but read. Um, and then be waiting impatiently until Saturday when he could take me to the library again. So that was that was who I was as a kid. I grew up, I became an English major at the University of Chicago and um, and thought I was gonna be a professor, And uh, but I did not. My grades weren't good enough to get into any of the schools I applied to. So then I was a little lost. I typed really fast because I grew up in a Polish Catholic community that had us all take you know, it was a working class community and I think they expected that many of us would end up in pink collar jobs. Um, so we had two years of typing, which has been incredibly useful to me. You know, I graduated eighth grade typing 60 <laughs> words a minute, finished college typing 120 words a minute just from practice. So I was always able to get gigs as an executive secretary, um, which is a pretty, mm -hmm. pretty sweet gig temping. And uh, I did that for years. Um, and at some point in one of those jobs, um, I had gotten some temp job that was receptionist, so I wasn't allowed to read because they thought it looked bad. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that's, that was uh -huh. a totally standard thing. I'm sure it still is, that you can't like sit with a book in yeah. front of you, even sure. though all you're doing is sitting here waiting for the yeah. phone to ring, which it rings like once an hour, right? right. So yeah. at, some of these, at some of these places, and so... <laughs> And so, but this was like the early days of computers. So I had, you know, 1993, 94, like there would be a computer in front of me, often without internet access because there was no, you know, lots of places didn't have internet yet. Um, so I could write. And so I found myself mm -hmm. writing poetry mm -hmm. for the most part. So I spent like a year writing poetry um, yeah. and then realized that I, um, was not going to be able to probably make a living writing poetry and um but maybe i could with fiction and i had written some fiction before and that's a whole whole another episode i suppose about how in college i was writing erotica and putting it on the internet and the shame of my parents and blah 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 blah. but um <laughs> it's one of my favorite stories it's a good story but it's a long story so we'll, we'll we'll table that for now um how i made myself a scandal and a hissing in the sri lankan community but uh i decided to write fiction. I applied to MFA programs. And this is where we, we intersect because this is um, where Clarion comes in. I ended up getting into the Mills College MFA program in California. I went out there um, and halfway through that program, I went and applied to Clarion and did Clarion in Seattle in 1997. And Clarion, it was called Clarion West at the time. I think still is. And yeah, um, and from that, you know, sort of like, and I, and I, and I had a little bit of a side path here because what happened is I went there thinking, oh, I really, really want to be a science fiction fantasy writer. Um, cause I love the genre so much. I'd been writing mainstream lit in my program and, you know, there was some good stuff there, but I, I wanted to write an epic fantasy novel perhaps. And I, <laughs> we got to week four <laughs> where we had some tour editors, Beth Meacham and Tappan King, who came uh, to uh, listen to our, our pitches, right? And I wrote this pitch and uh, it was, it bombed. It like, it's so bombed. I was the first one to volunteer to go. I like, yeah. typical South Asian, you know, overachieving kid, head of the class, hand up in the air. <laughs> I am the Hermione Granger of this story. Uh -huh. So, but I did not have the right answer. So, like, mm. it just went around the room with one person after another person basically kindly saying, Your synopsis sucks. No one would ever want to read this uh -huh. novel. Um, <laughs> they were really, I mean, by the, by the third person, when it became clear yeah. that this was going to be yeah, a bomb, every, every everyone was very nice about yeah. it, but still. Um, yeah. And then yeah. when, we had our little concept. One of the downsides of Clarion. Yeah. Well, is it, uh, the emotional is like you have to hear sixteen people say that. That's that's the. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's rare to have everyone agree that this was really bad. But um, <laughs> so, but and part of the problem was that I had written a summary and not a synopsis, and you know, so I had some misunderstanding of the form. But but leaving that aside, 
um, I then had my consultation with the editors. We had like these little 30 minute things afterwards with the visiting teachers. And they said they had read my earlier stories, which had all been kind of a little more in the magical realist vein. They were literary, yep. right? They paid attention to characterization and prose style and whateverness, and they had like a little touch of the fantastic in them, right? And yep. rather than being embedded in the heart of the field, and they sort of said, you know, we think your heart is in mainstream fiction, not in genre. And that's what you should be doing. And I went back to my room, yep. my little dorm room, I called up my boyfriend and I bawled. I cried for like half an hour. I'm never yep. going to be a genre writer. I just guess I just have to write mainstream fiction. This sucks, <laughs> right? Um, there's something very, I mean, there's, I mean, I realize this is your actual life and it is actually a very sad and traumatic experience, but there's something kind of hilariously inverted from how like the story is usually told. There's a wonderful, you know what I mean? Like it's kind yeah. of like doomed to the pre, to the dark outer precincts of of literary fiction and you know, know. Well, forced to write for you know yeah granta yeah that would be nice I mean, <laughs> so. I, uh, yeah I, you know i was just gonna say granta <laughs> i was just I was gonna say forced to write for granta but i was like well i don't know if she actually wrote for granta so maybe that's uh, but i was like yeah that's granta nice. call me I like right that so, yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I uh, yeah, exactly. I, I have not. I've gotten some good rejections from Granta and Harper's and Atlantic, yeah. and so on. I have a, a nice sure. queue of those those kind rejections. Yep. So, yep. Um, so anyway, I, I went away and I basically stopped writing genre fiction. I mean, I finished off Clarion. I didn't like leave in a huff, but I. I, you know, and I enjoyed uh -huh. my time there yeah, yeah, immensely yeah. and, you know, right. had the usual mad crush and, you know, et cetera. So I, I'm very glad I went. And it I probably helped transform you into a prominent genre editor, too. I mean, that's the other side. Of, that's another piece of your career besides as a writer. Is I think that... it, you, it helped embed me in the field oh. in that way. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I yeah. met some people. I got to, I mean, I got to Week two was, I, the reason I went to Clarion was because Chip Delaney was teaching week two, Samuel R. Delaney, yeah. mm -hmm. and I, he was my idol. I wrote my bachelor's thesis on him, and um, yeah, I wanted to be him. I was going to say that dad. that's, there's a way in which, I, I was, I was going to say it's also be interesting to have an episode, when you were talking about what you grew up reading and seriously yeah. seeking out the books of the, the dragons, I think it'd be interesting to talk about what we imprinted on oh, and yeah. both like overlap and also what's what's both different what do, does and doesn't overlap oh that would be great I, Darius I, I never read any what you never read any Delaney oh my god no no I just... no 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 opposite oh, no. wait I I, oh, okay. I paused Ooh. because you were saying to him no I, I Delaney is in the overlap no I never read any Bujol uh, so yeah. you, you you turned me on to Bajol, for instance, which is one of your big uh, hallmarks, yeah. but like I hadn't read. But Delaney is an intersection of ours. And I mean, in fact, it's, yeah. you know, you, you could argue that that's, that we, <laughs> presumably that on some level, that's why we met, because I also went to Clarion. I did not go when Delaney was going, but I realized I wanted to go to Clarion because I saw that he was teaching. He taught, he taught in 2000. Oh, and I was like, yeah. oh my God, that would be, and then I did, I had missed the deadline or it wasn't, I wasn't ready or whatever. But, and then um, Octavia Butler was teaching the next year. God. So I was like, yeah, she's, I, she's, if I had Octavia she's, Butler. I know, no. If I, she's the one who, I mean, Butler and Le Guin are the oh, ones that if I could have, if yeah. I, yeah, you know, like those are the two, but they're my yeah. three influences yeah, right yeah, yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. But, exactly. But, uh, and, that's, and those are, those are kind of my three core influences. But we should, we so should, we should a, do, we yeah, should do an episode about this. And in part, ours. cause I'd love to, if we do that, we should think about doing it with some guest people, mm -hmm. um, for yeah. pieces of it at least, because for example, when I went to Sri Lanka, um, God, it was like a year and a half ago now, uh, I met Yudanjaya Vidratna and, you know, he is an ardent, up and coming, brilliant young writer. And we were talking about uh, all the things we read that we have in common. We have a lot of the same taste in books. He actually, we brought him out to Chicago for the Deep Dish reading series. And so he stayed at my house and, you know, like all my bookshelves, he, he had read half the books on my shelves, right? But he'd never read Delaney because yeah. there is no Delaney in any bookstores in Sri Lanka, uh -huh. right? And it's just like uh, this yeah. massive, sure. horrible gap. And I'm like, oh my God, yeah. that's terrible, right? So, <laughs> and he, you know, like, and, you know, and there was this moment, like he was posting about it on Facebook and I was like, oh my God, I have to organize a mission to send many copies of Delaney to Sri Lanka. And, yeah. cause he, and I was like, literally like going to start like... <laughs> 
funding this, right? And then like one of his friends from Sri yeah. Lanka is yeah. like, you know, dude, you can buy electronic copies, you know, like go buy some. Uh -huh. and, he, <laughs> and I was like, oh, right. Okay. I don't actually have to like organize this. Oh, right. I'll send the print books. If this to were 1993, I would <laughs> no. need... Yeah, a so, creative book. So then he went and bought out. some digital okay. copies and has read them since. So, you know, yeah. and I'll take this. So anyway, that's a primary yeah. intersection of ours. That is a primary intersection of ours, and we should do a whole episode about it. So anyway, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up this bio to say that I went back, I wrote Mainstream Lit, I did a, I finished the MFA, I did some tech writing to pay off my MFA debt for a while, then I ended up. Um, following my boyfriend, uh, Kevin, to Utah, to Salt Lake City, where he was doing a postdoc, and I was, I did some adjunct teaching of freshman comp, as one does after an MFA, um, and uh, discovered they had a PhD program in creative writing, which was just barely a thing at that point, and this seemed like the best thing ever, so I applied, uh, got in by the skin of my teeth, mm -hmm. I was waitlisted, but Thankfully, they let me in. They, I did like meet with a, I met, this is relevant. I met with a, a professor there when I was applying to like get her advice on my application and she kindly read it and said, um, you know, I'm sorry. I think you're too commercial for our program. I don't think you're going to be a good fit. Uh -huh. um, so uh -huh. I am stubborn enough. <laughs> Damned like, well, if you I'm do. I'm applying anyway. <laughs> but it was, it was a funny moment. Uh -huh. Like like the genre people were saying I was too literary and the literary right. people apparently think yeah. I'm too commercial. And what I, does that mean? I know them feels. Yeah. So, um, but I applied, I got in and uh, ended up writing this book, Bodies in Motion, um, which was Sri Lankan immigrant fiction. Almost entirely realistic, although there's this one kind of magical realist moment at one point, but it might just be in her head. And uh, that got picked up by HarperCollins. It's a great and book. I love that book. I worked on it really hard for four years. It's a good <laughs> book. Um, so I... I wonder whether if you in, in imprint on Samuel Delaney at a, as a young age, you are setting yourself up for being told for the rest of your career that you're too <laughs> literary for genre and too genre for literary. I mean, come on. <laughs> it certainly happened to me. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I suppose that's possible. Although, you know, he managed, he's brilliant enough. He managed to win all the awards anyway. So, um, so. Yeah, but then, but it's true. But he, he, I think then at some point departed from the field in a, in a lot of ways, kind of unsatisfied with, you know, how, how anyway. Did, whatever, that's a different conversation. It's different a different panel. conversation because I think it's, it's, it's more about sort of the the content of his books perhaps yeah. than the yeah. than the prose yeah, quality right or any of any of that mm -hmm. so um okay so i don't know how do i finish this up i'm now i'm jumping ahead i am now a, a professor at the university of illinois in chicago um i'm in the english department i teach all kinds of things creative writing post-colonial lit science fiction, fantasy, also whatever else they asked me to teach. So sometimes queer lit, uh, sometimes women in lit, sometimes Asian American lit. Um, I live with my husband, Kevin, who is a theoretical math professor, um, a topologist. I don't understand anything he does. Uh, we have two kids, Kavya and Anand, who are currently 10 and almost 13. Uh, sorry, I got those reversed. So Anand is 10, Kavi is almost 13, and we'll, pr we'll probably, Ben and I being who we are, we'll probably reference the kids during these. So you need to know who they are. Um, and Kevin and I are poly, so I have one other long-term sweetie, Jed, um, who also went to Clarion uh, and who lives in the Bay Area, and we have been socially distanced from him for two months, which is sad. I miss him. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else really essential. I have a dog and two well, cats. I, think, I, I garden. I mean, I think that was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I garden. Well, I garden yes, and well, I cook. And, and I guess that's the last. The last thing is my most recent book is a Sri Lankan cookbook, A Feast of Serendib. And the last several years, I have been trying to navigate an increasing interest in domesticity, but also maintaining my interest in science fiction and fantasy. And this is, I am the despair of my agent who would really like me to pick one. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, he would like me to pick science fiction, but any agent would want me to pick something and stick to it because it's way easier to build a brand yeah. with one thing. Yeah. And I persist in being sure. pretty committed to both Again, of these. Again, preach. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, it, it, yeah. yeah. And I have ADD. I mean, and I mean, that's, 
there's a lot of strands. So yeah. I was going to say, I mean, I mean, and I think you touched on them, but I mean, one thing is that you're actually, I mean, one thing that's one, one, you have an outsized role in certain ways in, in science fiction community, um, both as an organizer, I mean, not just science fiction, but a lot of communities, both as a, as a aggregator of people, as a, as a leader, as a, as a creator of organizations and, 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 entities you know what i mean like that's that's an enormous kind of work that and and also like in terms of your um i think at certain various points in recent science fiction history you've had a really a crucial role as a voice around community and pol and political issues and mm -hmm. you know sort of sort of um yeah no i mean in a really don't mm, <laughs> no, like in a really good way like a really like was that a noise of dissatisfaction because i no, feel like this is a, this is this is no, no, a, it's, uh, it's accurate a very it's a, positive impact. it's a it's an interesting you know science fiction so i didn't mention the things that i've done in the field so like with jed and a bunch of other people we started strange horizons i ran it for two years and then handed it off to susan Grappi, who has handed it off to others and and certainly it's it's entirely possible that my biggest literary achievement will be having started that magazine because it, and it which is I'm going to hit its 20th anniversary mm -hmm. very shortly which is amazing to me so so I did that and it that. has been really focused on diversity and new writers and a lot of things that were you know relatively groundbreaking yeah and that's and that's why we started it and we should talk about Darius make a note in a future episode we should talk about why we started Strange Horizons <laughs> and how it has or hasn't uh, fulfilled its promise. I mean, I think it has very much so. And I'd love to, in fact, I'd love to do that episode with Charlie Jane Anders and Annalie Newitz because I've talked with them about it and they also have a really great sense of the field. Mm -hmm. So let's bring them in as guest uh, people on that episode. So um, and if I can get Ellen Datlow <laughs> and Sheila uh, Williams to come in as well. Or the that magazine would be, episode. Yeah. yeah, magazine episode. That would be sort of fascinating. Um, maybe Eileen Gunn, who did Infinite Matrix. So um, back at the But you the also day. started the Speculative Literature and then, Foundation. And then, and then and I run, the, I currently run, I know. Daggery and So I start <laughs> things. I do start things. I maybe start too many things. I, I, I think I, this may be. I mean, I, you I, start I, things I, and they flourish. So. So I think an overlap between us is that we have yeah. a strong interest in community, um, an area, you know, and in fostering community and like thinking through how do we help people's lives be better? Does that make, you know, like as a, on, a, on a very basic, simple level, you know, and I, I tend to think of it as the bossy auntie in my case, like I'm the, you know, like I've now I'm 48 years old, almost 49 and I've graduated you know, to like good auntie status. Like I'm the good auntie. I'm the one uh -huh. who you can come and tell me you're <laughs> pregnant and I'm going to help you sort it out, you know, but I'm also yeah. the one yeah. who is going to sit you down and say, Kunju, what are you doing with your life right now? You know, like, is this really what you want to be doing? <laughs> so, um, I, have achieved auntiehood. I love it. I really do. And it's, it's like yeah. the best role. And the, and I think we need to reclaim it. There's actually a podcast, Bad Brown Aunties, which I'm like, oh, I want to be a guest on that because, mm. like, I want to be one of them. But, um, <laughs> nice. But the, the, I guess a difference, I think, in how you and I approach things is that I don't think you have the same impulse I have that when I see a problem, like with Strange Horizons, the problem was that uh -huh. there weren't enough slots for pro writers in the field. My immediate impulse is to fix it. Like I'm, I'm a compulsive fixer and to fix it in a systematic way that will be self-supporting without me in two years. That's my goal, right? It's always my goal is yeah. to like, how yeah. can I build a structure I mean, that, that down, I can right. then walk away nice. from that's going to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Keep, I mean, we have that going. in common in the sense that I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't found organizations every 10 minutes, but we, we do have that in common <laughs> that I, I learned to, I mean, through trial and error, to not, I mean, I am, I am, a, I'm very, I, I don't start a lot of things necessarily, but I do have it often end up as sort of glue in communities. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think early experience of getting your parents to stop fighting is yeah. crucial <laughs> <laughs> in this biography. But, but, um, 
but but uh, and I and I remember having distinct um, experiences of sort of like realizing that things that I if I help too much things are dependent on me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I go away and then they break. You know. Right. And um, after having a couple of those experiences, I really and and I think I I think I also uh, consciously have tried to emulate you in some regards, but but. Um, that you've been an influence, but I, I, I think it's really crucial to have that ability of like setting things up and then having them scale, like having them, like if it, if it all needs, you know, me all the time, then I haven't actually created anything that I've just, I've just given myself more jobs, but I haven't actually created a, anything that, that. No, and I, I, and I think that no. scalability thing is like a tech thing that, I mean, I, I think literally I started thinking about that more when I was looking at like grants from Google and saw that they gave yeah. priority to yeah. projects that scaled well and I was like oh I've yeah. never thought in those terms before and I think there's a, a super I mean, interesting tension between the local yeah. and the scalable and there's definitely right there's definitely a seductive danger in the in the tech geek idea of scalability where it's right. sort of like 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 that way does lie dystopian horror it's it, taken to extreme right right but but certainly but there's a happy medium right so so and One there's hopes. some um well, I don't know, like for any given, well, it's an optimization question for any yeah. given, for any given situation, like a lot of times this drive towards scalability creates horror because you lose the human level and you have this, yeah. you know, I don't know, you have, you have the little, the, the bots turning the world into great goo. That's the, that's right. where scale, that's the end of scalability. But, but certainly the other side of that is, you know, somebody being just like, inundated with like so many people start a thing and then are stuck in it like a tar baby like they can't escape from the morass of like you know and and to be able to i think of um, this is the the pto problem like when our kids started school i yeah. i signed up for the pto right and yeah. kevin didn't yeah. want to and we had a little bit of an argument about this because he was like yeah. You know, I, I was sort of like, you're a guy, we should have men in the PTO too, yeah. and it shouldn't uh -huh. all be carried by women. You and I have very <laughs> similar jobs, and, you know, like, it's not, yeah. it's, you sure. know, so, and his argument was the PTO is just a waste of it, it's such an inefficient way to raise money for the school, uh -huh. um, having these bake sales and so on. Like, can't we just go and, like, you know, I don't know what it was he was imagining, right. but some other, you know, larger scale fundraiser or whatever thing that um, just make more money and donate it to the school and then be done with it and not have yeah. to go and do this. And I yeah. was like, you're, you're missing the communal aspect of yeah, like, uh, yeah. it matters that the moms come together and ideally the dads right. come together too and are like standing in the rain at the bake sale, right? Like, and having a conversation yeah. because that's where you find the resources for your ADHD yeah. son, right? Like this is that there's to a- To some extent the fundraising is just an excuse. I mean, or it should, I mean, really it right. shouldn't, you shouldn't need the fundraising to different right. You shouldn't need it's the very fundraising. Weird. It's very weird as a European. Like we yeah. spent a couple of years when my kids were, my, my son spent the last year of elementary school when we were in DC for two years. It was mm -hmm. extremely weird to like move to DC and send my kids to public school and then realize, oh, it's not actually public school. Like, you know what I mean? Not, <laughs> not by Smith standards. Like, yes, it's the public school, but like here in Ward 3 in the rich white part of DC, like, there is an entire aid in this classroom paid for by like the PTA raising money, which is like, that's, yeah. that's a semi-private school. <laughs> right. like, and our, you know, yeah. like our, our school, the PTO, like had someone who could write good grants. And so all the kindergartners had iPads, right? Like, right. And that know. was not the case in Ward 8. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I was sitting in DC. It was like, really? This is the, anyway. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so anyway, so that again, we'll come back to this. That's a whole episode in and of itself thinking about kind of like what is, what's, valuable at the local level and what's what can yep. be done on a larger scale thing i guess what i wanted to kind of pull out you don't have the same impulse to start things that i do and to like mm. build systems but i think what i find really valuable talking to you about these things whether we're talking about the structure of sifwa or the slf or you know any of these larger scale things is that um i get impatient i and this is partly because I have ADD and I have a billion ideas at once. You also have a billion ideas at once, but I, yeah. I get very impatient and I just, I, I have a real tendency to do like, well, this is good enough, right? Mm -hmm. There's that term satisfice, which yeah. is, you know, so like I, a lot of how I get things done and I get a lot done is because I'm willing to satisfy many things, right? Like yeah. I can yeah. make, yesterday I made, 
two batches of elaborate star bread, you know, the only reason I had time to do that was because we ordered a massive amount of Thai takeout earlier in the week. So like I haven't cooked meals in like six days, right? Uh -huh. So, you know, um, yeah. and that's fine. I'm perfectly willing to eat the same Thai food over and over and over again. Like that's good enough and I'm happy and it's supporting a local restaurant during the pandemic and we can afford to do it. And that's, that's a luxury and I'm grateful to have it, right? Like, so, sorry, that was a little side tangent. So, but the, but being willing to satisfy, I think can be dangerous. And mm. I think one reason why you don't start things and run with them quite as fast as I do, and I'd say this is also true of Jed, um, and it's something I really, and Kevin, I, I value about all three of you, is that you you think things through more deeply and <laughs> more carefully. No, you do, and you are, and you in particular are somewhat, un, oh, actually you're all, you're all uncompromising about um, sort of the morality, the ethics, and the, I'm thinking of things like in science fiction when Elizabeth Moon had been invited to be guest of honor at WISCON and yeah. then they were rescinding her invitation because of a racial issue that had come up online. And I, I was upset about that and I was thinking, you know, this isn't fair, this is given for her books, this is something that I love her books. I think they're so important, valuable to the field. There is a reason why they chose to honor her. And the fact that she has perhaps a flaw in this area is not. And you and I had a long conversation and it took you, I want to say maybe two hours to, you know, you may not remember this, but it made a big impact on me because you just kind of kept at me and kept at me explaining why it was that it was important that the someone who was, it, it wasn't just a book award, right? That this was guest of honor and guest of honor was representing the convention and it says something about the con, who you choose as your guest of honor, it says something about who is welcome and who's not welcome at that convention that year. Anyway, so I, 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 you made me think it through and I don't think, I, I don't know that I would have otherwise. My, I, I'm very impulsive and quick. And yeah. so you slow me down. I mean, in some, I don't know, I don't think of that as, uncompromising necessary I mean that the situation that you're describing it's like it's like I actually think that you and I are similar politically in this in the sense that we're very I mean you are also very um have a lot of integrity and you're very bold but you also I think both of us are like very uh like very um strongly seeking nuance and you know like the, the specific details of the case and so on like you know in that case i mean i don't think I, I think there was i think i think there was a popular position to say this person has done this thing they're a bad person done right you know what i mean like right. that, that yeah, is yeah. totally not my position and my position was like if she had won the tip tree they should invite her the guest right. of honor is a different job like do you fulfill yeah. the qualifications for this job you're the, the the job of the guest of honor is to unite you know this community yeah. It's more than like I'm giving you this plaque. It's like you're working. But you've been right. guest of honor at Wisconsin. <laughs> like you're working, and you I, and like you, the guest of honor is like this is a very important moment where they give this speech that really and 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 like if you have just said something obnoxious, I don't know. I'm not saying it's necessarily that somebody's political faba is unforgivable. But if you just said something obnoxious that has alienated half of the community, you have made it impossible for you to do the job, and it right. it, it is a job. Like right, like so. It's not like you don't deserve. To be, you know what I mean? It's not like right. a matter of of uh, of of you know your your work has merited this award. It's a matter of like we decided that you were a person who had the judgment and standing and ability to do this really important job in this community. And like, oops, <laughs> well, and, it, and it's that up. like yeah. that's a you know right. And I, I mean, I don't know whether you remember, but when I was guest of honor, I screwed up badly on a panel that year in the convention, uh -huh. and then. Um, I, I ended a up different case. No, no, no. It's actually case. well. What was what? What happened was that, you know, this was a panel. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to go ahead and go into this because I think it's 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 relevant. The the, the panel was I think it was called the language of fail. It mm -hmm. was a panel that was about <laughs> what do you do when you mess up badly in public um, yeah. on one of these you know social justice type issues when you you know show your ass. Sorry, bleep that out if we're. <laughs> 
I don't know how. I don't know. Are we swearing? I think it's probably I don't know. Fine. I think we should probably this is, swear. This is not public radio. I also almost never swear, so it's not going to come up very often. But um, <laughs> Catholic school girl, right? I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, I, I actually like never swore growing up. And like, I tried in high school and my best friend was like, you should not swear. You don't do it right. So, um, so, but. You don't do it right. So I swear I'm judiciously. Using, so I'm using the phrase though, show your ass, right? So I'm, and, and it's sure. kind of funny because this is like in quotes, show your ass. I can say it where I wouldn't otherwise, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what happened on the panel is mm -hmm. that mm. we were talking about the use of the N word and um, I said the word um, mm -hmm. and I said it in quotes. Like I think I had my fingers probably doing the air quotes mm -hmm. at the time because mm -hmm. I was quoting something about it. And, um, and then someone in the audience kind of raised their hand and they were like, look, I understand that you were just quoting it, but just hearing you say that is yeah. upsetting and hurtful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what happened in that moment, so here I was, language of fail panel. I had now mm -hmm. been called out decided, publicly. Decided to give an example of the. <laughs> of how to fail. Yeah, if only. <laughs> we'll now have a real yeah. exercise, real time exercise. Yeah. So the moderator actually like stepped in and kind of thanked them for their feedback and kind of tried to protect me a little by shifting uh -huh. the topic and calling on someone else. And I sat there bathed in humiliation because I, you know, I, as I was saying it, even though it was in quotes, it felt so yeah. weird coming out of my mouth mm -hmm. and I was kind sure. of regretting it immediately. Um, and I, it was almost like I was trying too hard and that was why it came out. Anyway, um, I ended up interrupting like, and I was like, I, I can't let this go. I can't let you protect me in this moment. Mm -hmm. And I think the mm -hmm. only reason I was I had the fortitude to do that was because I was guest of honor, right? Yeah. I was like, it is, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot. That's exactly what I was saying. Right, this is, a, that's, what I'm, that's why I'm connecting of the fact it, that your right? job does in fact require that you cannot, <laughs> Right, you know, I have to stand up and model away. how yeah. you're supposed yeah. to handle this. So now right. you guys have all told me. Right, which is why it was a different case. Which is yeah. why it was a yeah, different case. Yeah, but it's a and related actually, I think case. Yeah, but, so, well, yes, but I think... No, I could have you know, easily not done it. Like, that's the thing. Like, I you, almost did not have the emotional strength to apologize. Well, a, moment, and right? B, you, well, A, and B, you could have also doubled down, which is what Elizabeth Moon did, as far as I understand. So, as I recall, yeah, yeah, no, it was a I while mean, ago. But what, what very often, very she often happens in these situations... She apologized and then doubled down, but yes, yeah, and then, she and then D back. apologized. That's yeah. very typical, right? I mean, yeah. Which is not to say... I'm not, and I'm not... I'm, I'm all about Teshuva, right? I'm all about redemption, like uh, earned, redemp earned redemption, right? right? Like, like, like I have a very, you know, I, I, I have a very Jewish model of forgiveness, which is to say, like, like, which is interesting because there's not, there's, there's not quite as much hasty urgency to forgive, right? Yeah. Like there's a, there is a, there is a, there is a beautiful aspect in Christianity, which is this making forgiveness a paramount virtue, but it has this downside that you that, that, um, you know, that's there's sort of a little bit of an unsustainability about saying like essentially if you say that is incumbent upon good people to forgive then the only kind of out that you have if you're not going to forgive is that the person is not worthy of forgiveness like they're so bad or it was so bad if in fact forgiveness is something that only happens after like like once the person has atoned and made redemption and like satisfied, like they have to have erased the bad thing they did from the world and only then is it incumbent upon you to forgive, then like, you know what I mean? Like there's not so much pressure, but, but, but like, but, but the gates of redemption are always open. Like nobody ever fucks up so bad that they can't make up yeah. for it. Right. Like, I mean, I don't know. I'm, which is a bit of a radical position because you know, Hitler, but, but you know, there's some, on some level it's like, well, and I think time this travel, is, kidnap Hitler, and take him to the appropriate, you know. This is where I think you and I are. <laughs> I a mean, re facility. Well, uh, this, well anyway, let's not Godwin's law the conversation. But what no, I was no, going to no, say no, is, no, no, finish what you're saying. But I, I want to connect <laughs> well, that to Spock because. Okay, let's go well, back to Spock. But but what yes. I was going to say is, is that the crucial thing is the recovery. You know, people have it like the. Progressives are out to get you, and if you ever screw up, you uh, you know you you will you will die in the flames. But in fact, what happens is, and it's very understandable, but there is a vicious cycle, and we saw this. You know, we were we were both, I think, I had front row seats, and you were instrumental in in Race Fail 2009. Yeah. I mean, I was watching it unfold, and 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 there was a uh, you know, and and in fact, what happens is that people screw up, you know. 
particularly because they're miseducated. So if you're, uh, if you know, if you're, if you're, uh, have privilege, then you're like, you know, like it was like, you know, the exa the obvious example of Roosevelt was sort of like there was, there was, when Scalzi was like, what's the big deal? Why are you may why why don't pay attention to this kerfuffle? Right. Um, that was the kind of like you know dumb privileged thing that like you know as a white person you know like you're gonna do right in mm -hmm. a in a conversation on racism and the difference between that and like the Nielsen's Hayden's snarking at it and then doubling down is that Scalzi had like relationships with like you and Tempest and like a bunch of people came and called him on his shit and and I may not have the exact people right but you know what I mean and he I think he ended up my, I, I want to say I want I, I, people actually it wasn't me I, I knew him a little but I think mm -hmm. Tempest actually knew him and maybe Mary yeah. Robinette like literally called him on the phone. And I yeah, think that's yeah, exactly. an important, like they people, made that intervention, right? Exactly. To, and, and, and that, and the thing, that, that's why it seems to me like the, the, the recipe for these sorts of, of things is you actually, the work is done beforehand. Like if you have had, if you have already done, when it's not a big crisis where everyone is yelling at each other, if you have yeah. created the relationships where there are relationships of trust where people will come and say, this is a blind spot of yours, then in fact, it's predictable that you'll be able to do what he did, which is like, okay, I fucked up and now we're going to yield the floor and I'm going to give this huge microphone I have to Marianne and Tempest, right? And, mm -hmm. and, that, and that, that is a save. Whereas if you are surrounded by people who are going to like, like often what happens is somebody makes an initial apology Mm -hmm. the, the people who are still mad say some more mad things because they're still mad because your apology does not magically vanish them being mad. Right. Then the people around you start getting it into it with them and there's some kind of ad hominem like they're fighting each other and uh, uh, taking up swords on your behalf, right. your crowd. And then you unapologize and double down. Like that's a very typical well, anti-pattern. And it's right? super human, right? Like yeah. when that incident happened on the panel, right? So... Yeah. I apologized, which I think was the right thing to do in the moment. I and I talked through it. Like I was like, I am feeling shame. My face is super hot. You know, right, like it's right. it's actually really difficult to talk through this. I'm a little like I'm on the verge of tears, but like yeah. clearly I owe this and I'm gonna do right. it. And then um I actually ended up sometime later writing it up for my blog because I'm like, mm -hmm. this is another necessary part of the restitution, I guess, to like, you know, like mm -hmm. write this, maybe not necessary, but like, let me explain what happened and talk through it. And it's scary to do that. You're kind of exposed, you know, you take it from like yeah. the, the hundred people in the room to the world, potentially yeah. to see how you showed your ass. And, mm -hmm. um, and I was, I still want that particular woman <laughs> to come back and forgive me, right? Like there's a right. level in right. which, you know, right. I'm sitting here, right. Waiting, right. you know, like, and she does not owe me that. Nobody right. owes me that, right? right? Like, sure. you know, exactly. like, right. but there's yeah. a, I want someone, I want her to come right. and say, Marianne, you have made up for everything you did. You've erased it. And <laughs> you are absolved. You're absolved, right? Like, you know, sure. so sure. I'm with you. Catholic girl, you know, like absolution is part of, you know, you repent and then yeah. God forgives you. But, right. So right. I think that's, anyway, I, I'm not sure. I'm right. just babbling now. But there's I think no that's, guarantee. That's, but yeah. and that's part of the, and it, it, it doesn't matter, right? Like whether she forgives me or not, I think there's sure. a, there's a great moment in Bejold where Miles is struggling with sort of like social um, opinion of him being terrible. And his dad says to him, like, you know, it's not about what reputation. No, oh, I'm going to get this right. Reputation is what other people know about you. Honor is what mm -hmm. you know about yourself is, mm -hmm. I believe, the right. quote, sure. right? And there's, sure. so there's a sort of sense of like, you have to get to a point of like, okay, I now am confident that I've done everything I know to do to make up for this thing. And, right. and I'll, I'll keep listening in case, you know, somehow I'm missing something, but basically I think I'm okay now. That's never going to be any guarantee that the world is going to agree with you on that. Right. right sure. You know, you may still but, be soaking yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. And that's hard. Yeah. It's a hard place to be. But so. I think that that, the thing I was, the, 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 the they put, to bring this back originally to the original thing we were saying about you yeah. know, compromising and whether you, you know, it's, it's sort of like, I don't actually think that it's the first round that's usually crucial. You know what I mean? I think most things that people do wrong are recoverable and what, but, but tensions are running high and there's this very typical anti-pattern where your defenders have spoken up for you and gotten attacked for it. And so now you must defend your defenders, right. which makes it very hard to stay. You know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. that's sort of, then, then you get teams. What, 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 so what's well, actually really, 
That's really what Scalzi necessary. did right. Yeah. That's what he did right. Yes, you know, because if you're going to... He squashed his own defenders. He squashed he was his like, defenders, yeah. Exactly, they, and you, you have to do that. You have to have that muscle if you screw up. Of, it's not just your job to apologize. You apologize and then, just, and then to gently squash your defenders and say, no, shut up. They're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stop defending me. Like, that's necessary. That's right. a necessary, important step. And I think also it's, the, it, it's not just during, you know, if you, you – what I, what I found so interesting about that was it's the work that you're doing beforehand of having enough people in your life who will call you on your shit and who aren't sort of all going to necessarily agree with you or share the same blind spot that you have that's actually going to save you, yeah. right? Because, in fact, you, you, you're right, you need to have – you need it's 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 in the moment when it's already too late when everybody's yelling on the internet it's right. too i mean it, it's not really too late you could always i'm not saying it's hopeless but i'm saying your chances are far better if before everybody's yelling <laughs> you know what i mean you've kind of yeah. created or, or or a community has created i mean it's not just right. about a, a person it's about if a community well, has and, enough of these and, interleaving and to, be, to be fair i think we're still all learning how to navigate these social dynamics on a world stage right yeah and so things like yeah when when a magazine screws up or the when an institution screws up i think yeah. there was like there's an immediate like people want a really fast apology yeah. and i think yeah. one thing that we've had to that we're still learning is that you know, like, let's say a convention is messed up. You're talking about mm -hmm. maybe 20 volunteers scattered across the world mm -hmm. who have day jobs, who aren't being paid to do this. And like, now they have yep. to navigate this very difficult thing. Right. And I sort of remember there was sort of a moment where, where we, we came to some understanding that the thing to do is immediately post something saying, we've just we learned about, about this. this. We've yeah. heard about this. We're talking about it. We yeah, are 20 yeah. volunteers scattered across the whatever. Yeah, we expect yeah. to get back to you within a week or two weeks or whatever with, yeah. a, you know, with something. And and now I think, I think we I think I saw that with the with the otherwise with the tip tree turning into the otherwise with that. Yeah. It was definitely like there's that there's this sense and it, because the scale it's not just that first of all everyone is now always talking into a microphone which might get turned on and broadcast <laughs> to the world like right. it's usually not on but at any moment somebody yeah. might in another room might switch the switch and you might be talking to the world. And the other thing is that like we now expect YouTube scale, like time scales of response to, yeah. you know what I mean? Or sort of like, you're like, like when I say YouTube, I mean like a YouTuber who's just not, this isn't scripted. They're just, right. they, they or like it's live streaming. They see it in the comments and they respond yeah, like yeah. that. We expect that time scale of, of the instantaneous internet for. So there's a certain um, like human forgiveness, right? Like of like wanting to, I think we're coming to a better understanding of not not just forgiveness, but like just the human scale of it, of like this isn't going to be instantaneous and it's okay. Like what yeah. we what we want is the acknowledgement and a sense that the person is working on it. Right. And it's yeah, gonna get back think, to us in a reasonable amount of time. Right. So Yeah, and I think there's I think there's also again, there's a certain amount there's like it's like the work beforehand matters because it's like Jed's idea or it's not Jed didn't make up this, but I always remember Jed talking about author points, like sort of yeah. the, the uh, you know, the, how much slack you're, how much benefit of the doubt when you read a text. And it seems, if you read a text and it seems stilted and clumsy yeah. and you don't know the author, you're like, well, this probably isn't very well written. If it's somebody, you, an author you trust, you're like, oh, I see the narrator has a stilted right. and clumsy voice. I wonder why that is, right? And like, similarly, like, you know, there's a certain amount of, of credibility, you know, that you have yeah. to, like, and, and this is when I take a new, computer job i sort of have this like they would talk to my wife esther like a lot where it's like well there's a bunch of like cram at the beginning you know what i mean mm -hmm. there's a bunch of sort of like extra hours to establish credibility like the first couple of things you have to like if you make the first couple of deadlines swimmingly then all of a sudden there's a you know the every the way that everyone listens to anything else that happens on the project is totally different right yeah. like they are like oh well we know that it's a reliable team. So obviously this is, whereas if you screw up the verse and everything is treated with suspicion and it, it balloons way out of proportion, yeah. like the amount of, like so much work is saved by establishing credibility up front. Anyway, I'm just saying when, when an institution yeah. says we need a moment to think, if you have a certain amount of background trust in that institution, you're going to be like, oh, well, of course that's understandable. Yeah. If it's their, you know, if it, it's sort of they've eroded that credibility yeah. or whatever, then, then often you're like, oh, well, that's typical. Well, so. the, author, the author point thing is, I think, a good illustration of this, right? So, so just to, for anyone who hasn't heard about it, the idea is that you come into like a new text and the author has a certain number of points 
uh, if they they can get points because you trust them already. They can get points from you very quickly if they have beautiful prose and you value beautiful prose, or if they have you know like there are a lot of things that that uh, you might have from the beginning, before the beginning, or at the beginning, and then they can spend those. So like a new Faulkner novel is going to come in with a lot of author points because people trust it, even though The Sound of the Fury is immensely confusing when you start it <laughs> off, right? It's going to have a really good payoff. There's a reason why he's doing what he's doing. This is one of my 10 favorite books of all time, so I recommend it to everybody. Um, and, you know, whereas, like, if you're starting The Bone People, which is similarly confusing, maybe you don't know that Carrie Holm won the Pulitzer Prize, which, no, sorry, the Booker Prize, which that would give you author points um, that yeah, you won this yeah. major literary award. But if you didn't know that, you'd be just like, who is this person? This is super confusing. This is another yeah. one of my 10 favorite books of all time. So those are my two recommendations for you. Sun and the Fury. The <laughs> people. Um, you should read them both. And there you will should be read links. And Delaney, lots of Delaney. But um, start with the short stories. Well, uh, I don't know. Start with start with something. Something shorter. Uh, don't start with Dahlgren. Uh, really? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you should uh, start with Dahlgren. <laughs> oh, no, no, Benjamin, are you kidding? No. Or stars in no. my pocket like grains of sand. That's a great one, but no, I, I think the the one oh I'm gonna blank on the title, the short the short one about language and aliens. Babel uh, seventeen. Babel seventeen. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Sure, sure. Or or that's or the for. short story about the Frelks, which is what I give my students. Um uh, but, uh, I'm blanking I'll, I'll, on the title. I and Gamora? Yes, I and Gamora, which is also yeah. the title of his short story collection. Um, anyway, coming back to this, I want, I want to finish what I was saying about author points in this context. And the novel I'm working on, one of the novels I'm working on is a science fiction novel that you read an early draft of the opening. And um, it has a, uh, not a rape scene exactly, but a rape scene. It has a, a scene of sexual coercion early on. And I'm still, super hesitant about it because I feel like, okay, there's going to be people who come in and say, well, this is Marianne. I trust her to handle this well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm going to, um, you know, this is not going to be glorified. It's not going to be played for titillation, et cetera, so on, which mm -hmm. I, I hope I don't. Um, it's going to have long-term consequences and, you know, so on. But I, I also have to kind of accept that there's going to be people who, A, either I have no author points with them because they come in knowing nothing about me and they've just picked up this book off the shelf, they start reading it, there's a sexual assault on page 10 and they're like, well, I'm done with this and they put it right, down. Right, 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 um, sure. And there are going to be people who it doesn't matter how many, and this is what I want right. to get to, it doesn't matter how many author points I have, right. that's just a hard line for them. They don't want to read yeah. that. That's whether or not they think it should be done, like that's going to ruin any entertainment for them, right? Like they're, they're, and, yeah. and which I completely understand because interestingly, like I can read about sexual assault and I'm okay, but I have a hard time seeing it on screen. So mm -hmm. um, Kevin and I were once watching a movie and it was some literary movie that did a, a very good job of it in some sense. I don't remember the title. I kind of blocked it out. Like I had to stop watching because it got to mm -hmm. this, coercive scene and I was like I, I know these characters I'm invested in them I hate this it's upsetting me yeah. it's making me think about all kinds of things in you know and I've never been raped but you know these coercive moments in my mm -hmm. past whatever that were yeah. difficult and I was like I just don't have the fortitude to, to deal mm -hmm. with this and I'm just done right and I yeah. like I've never stopped made him like stop watching a movie with me before like, that was, like <laughs> there's this moment yeah. of like I'm done you can finish this on your own but I can't I don't right. watch it right. anymore. Right. so there's a I think that connects back to the you know there are going to be people who you you can't make enough restitution I guess you can't yeah there's no way you can make this okay for them um this thing that mm -hmm. you did and I think that's yeah. another hard aspect of this right there are people yeah. who are you know when people who won't read orson scott card won't read bradley um mm -hmm. i find that difficult because ender's game and speaker for the dead were i think i think they're brilliant and i think they're important humanist novels and they were important to me um bradley was incredibly important to me with her avalon with, with both what she mm. did with mists of mm -hmm. avalon but particularly what she did with the spell sword and um, the forbidden tower which has poly stuff in the in the context of this fantasy world of dark over 
but both of them have um, some major problematic ethical sexual stuff that um, well that have, that have real left. life stuff right what sorry yeah in real, life, in, like the real life yeah. in real life in real life which has led to a large portion of the community being like i'm never going to read them again i don't want to yeah. send money to them and i i totally understand mm -hmm. that right like you know there are people yeah i also have don't have a hard I mean, time watching but there's others right there are other ones where i'm like well i'm gonna keep talking about bradley and i i know that's gonna be hard for some people and maybe they're gonna write me off as a result right and so um yeah. I mean, and I think there's, I think there's also, I mean, there's a bunch of levels there, right? Because there's yeah. sort of like, there's sort of like, um, there's sort of like a decision level where it's like, or an ethical level where it's like, I'm not going to, you know, read Bradley or listen to Michael Jackson or whatever, because I think this, or watch Woody Allen movies, because, you know, this happens beyond the pale and I, I do not want to support it. That's like right. a conscious level. And then there's another level, which is just like, yeah, it just ruins it. Like, I just don't yeah. want to watch Woody Allen because it's just, it's just like, it, it's aesthetically that, like, that is a thing I know and I can't not know it. And so I don't, you know, and I but mean, then, but, but there's yeah. like you as an individual, but also you as a scholar and academic in the community, mm. right? Yeah, well, like that's, in the, a, yeah. that's a different level. Like I, I don't, yeah. I don't want to watch Bill Cosby now, it, which is upsetting because I used to love him. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also have no obligation. I don't work in that field. I don't, you sure. know, like I'm not, sure. I'm not writing comedy. I'm not working right. on, he, if I were, or if I were like yeah. a scholar studying like comedy in America sure. or black entertainment figures, I mean, he's hugely important. You have mm -hmm. to talk about him, I think. Yeah, right? sure. So, well, and that's, that is a different, that's a different job and there's a different yeah. context. And, and I mean, it's not, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's I'm like, sure. And, and uh, yeah, you should, Talk, I mean, if you're doing the history of early American cinema, you would want to talk about D.W. Griffith, right? I mean, right. you know, I, I don't know, or and maybe Lainey Reifenthal. I mean, right? <laughs> like, I don't know. There's no, there's no, there, there. You know, I mean, and 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 there's also people who are um, arguably, you know, terrible, and it doesn't ruin it. Like, mm -hmm. arguably, like on, on some level, I mean, on a purely aesthetic level, like the knowledge of H.P. Lovecraft's racism. I mean, honestly, like the story, it, like the stories are like the, it. He's think, less sympathetic. Like he seems more repulsive, but he never seemed that. Like that's not a feel. You don't have a warm so fuzzy feeling for the narrator, anyway. So I don't know Lovecraft well, so I, I feel yeah. like I can't. I should go read him at some point because I, I think it's an important aspect of the field. But I do think that sometimes the real world stuff permeates the books, right? It does. Oh, and that's my so, point. Sometimes, well, it does, some, sometimes it doesn't like sometimes like Wagner I don't know you know like I'm like do I, I don't know anything about oh, him I totally and, get it from Wagner but but yeah. in fact so, I in fact I in fact it's funny because sometimes I don't know anything about I don't know anything about Beethoven's politics mm -hmm. really but just from listening to Beethoven I feel like he's an asshole <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? But anyway, I would say I was going to say about Lovecraft is that the aesthetic is different from the political. Like politically, I might, if Lovecraft was alive and getting yeah. rev and getting royalties or something, I'd probably be like, you know, yeah. no, you may not have any mind share, you racist. But on the other hand, like knowing that, love, right. like people have done these great rifts on Lovecraft, like Matt Ruff and everything, where well, you're where you're sort of you're sort of taking it. Yes, he was a racist. That's the whole point. Like his his horror of like, you know, other kinds of people coming and miscaginations. Right. It's like shot through the books. It's like, but right. it's like, it's like, it's like, there's nothing more Lovecraftian than Lovecraft going insane because people are brown. You know what I mean? Like, right. you know, and, so. and so, and like you see N.K. Jemisin, right? Her latest novel, I'm blanking on the title, mm -hmm. but it's a Lovecraftian mm -hmm. figure. Yeah creature like yeah. breaks through into New York and it's all about the different boroughs and there's a lot of race politics yeah. in there yeah. and she's just confronting it head on and making yeah. it you know part it, of it, it I also Lovecraft like racism has been kind of an, a gold mine for anti-racist Lovecraftian writers right <laughs> right like, and another, another, <laughs> so another way, example like, of that like in my in there's a class I teach in of writer, you know sort of writers of color 
in yeah. science fiction fantasy, and we start the we start the series with Conan the Barbarian. Um, uh -huh. Actually, we start with your story, The Orange, but then because we, we have uh -huh. a whole thing about, you know, is Jewishness, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. should, should people like Ben be included in this class on writers of color or not? And so <laughs> that's actually what we spend the whole first class on, um, and it works that's really hilarious. well. It's hilarious that you've turned our very funny um, uh, argument on the way to Wisconsin about whether or not I was white into an entire class. That's well, I, I think, uh, first I think class that, of a class. That's got to be an episode. So uh, Darius, yeah. make a note. We got to talk about whether Ben is white <laughs> or not. Um, that'll be a whole episode in of itself. But the uh, yeah, but no the, brief note. I think I am. Yes, and I actually agree at this point. But it took me a long time to get there. So, yeah. um, so the the. Sorry, the, the second class is Conan the Barbarian. We read Queen of the Black Coast, which is hugely racist, like as, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, like it's just like completely permeates. But yeah. then we read Charles Saunders, the opening to his novel Amaro, which is about mm -hmm. a black figure, sword and sorcery mm -hmm. type hero, who is yeah. a Conan type figure. And seeing yeah. what Saunders does with that trope yeah. is fascinating, yeah. right? And yeah. uh, anyway, I don't know. the. If you're listening to this podcast, what you're going to get from Ben and me is <laughs> a lot of argument. Um, yeah. Mostly we're on the same page. We haven't been arguing that much well, this, argu this, argu this argu episode. Not, not arguing against each yeah. other, right? No, like, no, no. A lot but sometimes of, like, we debate quite fiercely. Yes. So, um, but a lot of kind of detailed nuance. Um, and I think I would say we're both, you know, we, we, we wanted to, we were going to call this, like, what should we call this thing? Because we still don't oh, have yeah. a title Oh, yeah, we haven't talked it. about that yet. And we're, I want to kind of, like, segue into that because I've been thinking mm. about it sort of in the back of my head. <laughs> and I have a couple of possibilities. Like, okay. we talked about the Marianne and Ben show. That's a little flat, I That's think. That's a little on the nose. Yeah. yeah. Well, I kind of like Marianne and Ben's traveling fa phantasmagorica, um, okay. except that it's hard to say and hard to spell. So, mm. but, like, that kind of sense of, like, wonders and marvels and like mm, a, a roaming mm -hmm. convention that could go almost anywhere um mm. something along those lines i kind of love yeah. um there's you know mr there was a there's a memoir called oh i can't remember the name it, mr somebody's with a w mr weschler's i don't know cabinet of wonders and mm -hmm. it's a uh, so i kind of like that concept yes. of marvelous like, flying machine something Yes. Yeah. So there's that. Another one I was thinking of as a That's title a is, is about like being human. Um, because I sort of feel like in everything we've been talking about, everything we think about, and this is a very science fictional thing. It's a very fantastical thing. These kind of questions mm -hmm. about what it is to be human. But I also think you and I bring a very secular humanist, maybe Jewish humanist. I don't know. But I, I bring a very <laughs> secular humanist perspective to much of what I do. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you told me at one point that what I really wanted to be was a public intellectual. And I'm still, I, I, I think I, <laughs> I agree, except I'm not sure exactly. Well, that's among the things. I, I, you don't have to limit but, yourself to just that. But I, you know, like, <laughs> I, I don't know that I know really what that means exactly, because I'm not. I'm not sure I said you wanted to be that so much as that you. I am that. Ought to be or are engaged in that. Anyway, yeah, but I think, on. well, I think there's a question of breadth versus depth that I get a little hung up on, right? Because, and this is, you know, whatever, imposter syndrome, academia, you know, like, mm -hmm. there's a way in which I'm a, I'm a generalist, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. you know, I have some specific knowledge in science fiction. I have some specific knowledge about Sri Lankan cuisine at this point after immersing myself for a few years. But um, for the most part, I'm a generalist and an enthusiast, and um, and I care deeply about humanity. And I think you are in a similar position. Does that make sense? So anyway, that's yeah. What I, was I, about. I like. Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if I like. I don't know. I don't know if the human thing is clicking for me yet as the title. <laughs> but I do think that yeah. um, I like. I mean, I think it's interesting. The I mean, there is a theme about specific in general. I mean, the thing about being a generalist is interesting because I sort of feel like that's one of the one of the greatly fun things about being a science fiction writer in this era is that you kind of it's kind of like a um, still a space where you get to be this sort of I don't know 18th century notion of a of a of an academic you know what I mean like academia yeah. is actually analyzed in these is organized into very super specialized um, categories like when I was in high school. I had a, 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 among the things that our little gang called itself was like the pseudo intellectuals yeah. because we, and we kind of had this sort of 
badger I'm kind of accurate of saying like what, what we like to read things and then what we care about is what the things make us think about. Mm. We don't really know what the authors of the things were meaning them to, to mean. What, right. what, we're, what we're going after here is having like cool cool ideas, cool like the cool brain things happen when we read these things. That is, you know. Yeah. And like then I went away to a fancy schmancy college and I got like a fancy schmancy education and it beat out of me the notion that I should just like have wild leaps between one thing and another, because really anytime I thought of any thought, there was a bibliography of things I really ought to read first in mm -hmm. order to verify that I was carefully and in a carefully scholarly way, making a defensible assertion and it should have like a lot of thought of qualifications. But, but let me ask you a question yeah. about this. So I, I feel like I go back and forth on it because I do off, like I want to encourage that that like jumping off point to a general discussion, but I do sometimes get really frustrated by the people who are spouting off without having done a oh, minimum yeah. of background. Like, you know, oh, I don't know what that like minimum is, but like, you know, whether it's, you know, right now there's, everyone has become like an instant expert on <laughs> the pandemic, right? Like, yeah, and yeah, it, yeah, yeah, right? Like, no, and no, I'm like, I, like no, what the heck do I know about epidemiology? Nothing, right? Don't get like, me wrong. I do, yeah. don't get me wrong. I'm not endorsing the opinions of my 17 year old self as like the <laughs> ideal that we should all return to. I'm 50. It would be very unbecoming for me to have exactly the same. I mean, at 17, it's fine if you're like, I just read a thing and now I think a thing. I, I don't, I don't think that that would be me to take but i am saying Not that to, there was by the kind way, of a, our, our our sound engineer darius vinazar is 21 and is listening to all of this so um so we're enjoy not, it we're, while you can man <laughs> Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're not dismissing 20 22. year olds. 22, 22, sorry. Uh, well, in that case, it's too late. I'm sorry, the <laughs> clock has run out. You are, you are required to be judicious and careful in all your utterances after 22. What, what, I, <laughs> what, what I was going to say, though, is I think there was, well, I, to, to finish that story, you know, then I got stomped on by this pile of books, which I had yeah. to read before I could think of anything. And it took me a long while to kind of crawl out from under it, which is not to say I'm not sad that happened yeah. because I actually think there is a richness and a depth that I actually do care when I read a text now, what did it actually mean? Like what, I mean, you can never get at what it actually meant, but what did they, what was, what would it, would it, how would its first readers have taken it and how is that different from how I take it now and how, you know what I mean? Like I'm not just content with my first like thought about it. Yeah. That, yeah right. And especially if it's something about, yeah, if I expect it to have a bearing on reality, like the pandemic, that's a whole different kettle of fish. But but I do think that there is a lovely privilege in being able to, you know, in, in writing science fiction is in a way the broadest remit. Literary fiction ended up in sort of a little bit of a cul-de-sac for a while where the proper topics of inquiry were all about human interiority. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You could, you could write about um, like, you know, what, a, what, what looking at a rainbow make you feel. But once you got into how rainbows work, you were kind of straying outside of... I mean, it could be a little bit of a clever experimentation of dumping in a little info dump coyly or ironically, but like you weren't really meant to sort of write a write a thing. You weren't meant to like write a literary fiction. It's so funny, you, like you say scared. that, and I I want to argue. I mean, I agree yeah, with you broadly. Like, no, 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 I don't. I like I, I'm mostly just calling out like that. It's such a it's such a funny impulse that I want to be like, well, but what about Nabokov and his butterflies and you know? But like, sure, the, the, sure. The but I mean, I'm not saying no, no, yeah, no. I think you're, but, you're but right. it's a. Yeah. But it's a, but it's always, a, I mean, there, you, I mean, not, there's always counter trends, but certainly like yeah. your base standard, yeah. whereas, whereas the, the, there's a way in which science fiction is this wonderfully wide field of play where you can either decide, I want to write about loss and fatherhood, or you can decide, I want to write about, like, would it be possible to like have a species where one would be like, you know, one, one have to have DNA work differently so that one, like one organism has DNA and the other DNA, other organism edits that organism's DNA. You know what I mean? And you could write about either a thing that's about the world or a thing that's about the self or a thing that's, and you, and you just have Although to learn we, enough. You okay. Know? I mean, when you write about a thing that's about the world, isn't it always also about the self if it's going to be right. good, good fiction? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Because you could just but write also, an essay about the thing, right? Well, like, you, could, you could go off and do a science essay, indeed. right? And, so. and, and in a way, when you write about the self, it's always about the world. It's just yeah. that there's a, there's a space to acknowledge both yeah. sides of it and to come from either angle. And I think that, because I think if it's not at all, I mean, it's also okay for it not really to be about the world at all. It's also okay yeah. for it just to be about self. But there's a way in which I think science fiction is strongest when it is not entirely collapsed to allegory. 
You know, when you're not only like, of course, you're saying when you talk about the the magical thing, it somehow metaphorically connects to the personal or emotional yeah. thing. But if it only is an evocation of the, you know, it's, it's like allegory. It's like, well, yeah. they're vampires, but really they're just annoying people. Like that, that does lose something of the magic of it being yeah. this liminal space where it's like, well, they're kind of also vampires. Yeah. Um, but, but the thing about, um, uh, oh dear, have I lost my train of thought? So the thing about, um, where was I? <laughs> <laughs> seven layers deep and I, <laughs> I got lost too um you were talking about the role of the i don't know the way we think yeah just that just the space the, of generalism just the, yeah. the space of being and the, the, the thing you're saying about like well don't you need to know something about it the interesting thing is that there's a wonderful bit where when you're writing fiction you're evoking an imaginary world you do it's good if you're not talking out of your ass to some extent but i used to be much more scared of research i used to be much more like well i can't write anything in historical it'll be a bottomless pit i can't write anything that you know i don't really understand that part of physics you know i can't and now i'm like you only you legitimately this isn't it's a magic trick a stage magic trick but it's not illegitimate, you actually only need to really understand the part that you're shining a flashlight on. And in fact, yeah. in some ways, it, it can be very helpful not to, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, you don't want to be, like, it's useful. I don't know. Like, it's, it's, um, like, I, I will totally, like, go and, like, it sometimes go and like calculate how many light years something is from something and how long you know like yeah. try to estimate like the relativistic you know how long would it, going at a quarter of the speed of light how long it would take or whatever like right like mm -hmm. it will totally geek out about details but there's another way in which those details are there to part of what i'm doing when i do that is not that i'm going to get anything right mm -hmm. like when i try to write science fiction that thinks about the future truly it's not that i'm trying to get it right because yeah. i'm not going to be able to say anything accurate about the future and it's not that i'm pretending to expertise about the thing. It's more that I'm pushing my mind by forcing it to engage with some aspect of the real world. So that's, that's because of... That, so I find, as a writer, I think I have a lot of trouble trying to write science fiction that is more than a little ways out, right? Yeah. Because... Uh, <laughs> this is a difference of ours because I... <laughs> well, that's the thing. You do 14 like... 14 billion years in the future. You yeah. do way far future stuff. And it's always really fascinating to me seeing how you approach that because I get kind of caught up in the re realism of the extrapolation and I get mm -hmm. a little strangled, mm -hmm. right? So I'm like... So right now I'm working on something that's like four generations out set on a terraformed planet and the my my critty uh, my my jump space universe and i'm trying to write some of the things that are leading up to that point mm -hmm. and uh, I, i'm getting a little bogged down lost in like making all the extrapolation plausible realistic like mm -hmm. well you know if we had developed hologram technology you know i only want yeah. it so that i can have the scene where they're holding hands in their little hologram <laughs> suite yeah you know yeah. but if they've got the tech in four generations that's going to have massive repercussions for the rest of the universe right like right. for, for right. all of humanity sure. right and, right right and i get and I guess there's just well, that, a huge yeah. suspension of disbelief that we're not even yeah. going to pay attention to that. The readers just accept that, of course, this isn't realistic because, in fact, like, you know, when we go to the moon and, you know, we, the space develops, you know, tech stuff that lets us have computers in our palms now these days, like, mm -hmm. you know, Turing did not envision that, right? Like, so, yeah. and, and, yeah. Couldn't, and probably couldn't have envisioned that or, mm -hmm. or maybe he could have, but like, I guess there were science fiction writers who were envisioning handheld computers, mm -hmm. but sorry, I've like rambled off here. Including Ian e. Forrester. Well, maybe yeah. not handheld computers, but sort of the internet. But yeah, no, but I, I mean, there, there, that is a real interesting question. And I think there, I think also there's more than one kind of story and more than one kind of approach to the problem. On some level, I think you have to, the, the, what's really important is you're playing with the reader's expectations. And often when the reader is kicked out of the story, it's not the thing you, that they're looking at that's kicking them out of the story. It's right. the thing you didn't do before to set it up. And, and, and so in a way, it's like, if you take the right tone, then everything can be quite fanciful and the reader will discard any worry of, you know. But on the other hand, if you take, if you kind of promise, like we're going to be engaging with some aspect of the real world we want this is i'm interested in thinking about this you can't then bail halfway i mean nothing frustrates me more than you know when when some uh when some science fictional 
proper some, some of my friends hate going to science fiction movies with me because i will be like you know i'll be like caught up and like but no but if they had that then they could have had that and you know like so so like i will i will obsess on plot holes more than more than many people who are have a much a much easier time letting go i mean other things of course I love that are totally slapstick and silly, but that's the thing is it's, if it's, if it's, you know, I'm not so expecting part of that is that part that of the science and Rocky like horror be right. Setting the genre expectations correctly, right? Yeah. Like we've been, we've been introduced, our, one of our pandemic things is that yeah. uh, while we're sheltering at home, we started watching Doctor Who with the kids, um, yeah. starting with the reboot. So we've been watching it every mm -hmm. night and my son Anand is very, um, analytically minded right mm -hmm. so we had mm -hmm. to have a big series of conversations about mm -hmm. no you can't actually question the science of doctor who it makes no sense right so like these have become catchphrases it's a fairy in, in tale, house, yeah. right like the, yeah, yeah. the science is not going to make sense and oh yeah this episode the science really doesn't make sense right, 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 like, right, right. you know we just we just watched the episode where like every human on the planet has their dna rewritten to become the master sorry uh -huh. spoiler yeah. but like it's, it's sure. you know and like you know they yeah. just have doctor who just has everyone like shake their heads a lot and then suddenly they turn into this other person right and like right this is, right, right 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 you know and so we have yeah, people I mean, that are like this is not even close and yeah. and you know, that's I think okay, I just, right? Because Doctor I think Who I just sets think, your expectations. Yeah, exactly. Well, right? and there, and there, I feel like with Doctor Who, there are episodes. I feel like you have to play by your own rules once yeah. you set the board. I feel like there are episodes of Doctor Who where I'm like kicked out of the story because it's implausible, even by Doctor Who standards, right? <laughs> so, where there's many, where I, I don't actually mind the master thing in mm -hmm. a way because I'm like, I feel like that plays by the no, rules I of Doctor I Who. It was fine. I feel was... like, I feel like the one where the moon hatches into a giant. Uh, yeah dragon or something and there's like little termites that live on the moon because termites live on like that i'm like no even even for doctor who but there are but you know but but there's a lot of them where i'm like sure that's timey-wimey and so in some is. ways in some ways i was going to say in some what you were saying about it, it's like oh i Finish. you know i me writing in far future things in some ways the more extravagantly far future in a way the easier easier it gets you know what i mean if you're trying really? to do near future if you're trying to do medium term stuff you have to know how the fact is that the, the the technology on gallifrey is so outlandishly far from ours yeah. that the idea that you know i think maybe you know it's not very hard for me to I, I have something i call the minimal invasive retcon which is how much do i have to hand how much do i have to tell myself in the background of this story how much extra info do i have to add to make what's on the screen make sense Right. Yeah. And so very often it's not very much. So in the case of the doctor of, of the mas master rewriting everyone's DNA, so they turn into the master and they shake their heads and they turn into this. It's actually very hard because I just think he's using DNA as a shorthand. I yeah. think he's not actually he when he says DNA, he doesn't he's just dumbing yeah. it down for for humans because there's no way he could. But in fact, who knows? Maybe there are little <laughs> femto machines in every single quark that he's inserted into all the quarks in the people, and they all synchronize at once. And yeah. you know, it's just like I mean, once you I mean, I, I don't actually have all that much trouble supposing that Gallifreyans have a way, it probably doesn't have anything to do with DNA, he's probably using DNA as yeah, a metaphor, yeah. like he would, would say, like, you know, it's like fire inside them, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's trying yeah, to yeah. explain it to humans, but, but, you know, I mean, I don't let know. Me, let me ask you the question then. Yeah. So, where I run into, again, trouble with this is, um, so, how to put this, um, when there is a mismatch between yeah. so so when things are really far future and there's all kinds of wacky stuff happening but the but this the characterization etc is very mm -hmm. human realistic right right, right. um yeah there's this yes. i i i have a little bit of just so i don't know whether you've seen the recent series um star trek picard at all i haven't i want to but uh, i don't have any I don't so have the watch right it i'll be super thing. curious what well you i can't but when i get somewhere i can watch it i'll watch it i guess okay. i could buy it on itunes you could buy it it's it's i mean yeah. i'm a huge trekkie so i'm you're yeah, gonna yeah, you yeah. guys are all gonna you know i'm a trek this. skeptic but yeah i like I, some i am an ardent trekkie I, I but, I, but that, which doesn't i'm mean a reformed I, trek hater which actually. doesn't mean that i won't critique it <laughs> and i i i have this incredible mixed reaction to picard I think uh -huh. I can talk about this without wrecking it because on one level on the on the characterization level mm -hmm. it succeeds brilliantly which is what I would expect with Michael Chabon as showrunner right huh. so, I did not know he was the showrunner Oh my god the 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 scenes yeah. are beautiful the uh -huh. right. little little character moments between people are gorgeous it adds I think a real level of literary quality to star trek that i love yeah. that wow. i'm not used to seeing in the in, uh -huh. in in the tv star trek i mean i think discovery also did 
some yeah. more stuff along those lines, but it this, but then where I, I have to say it failed for me mm -hmm. is the overarching plot, the mm -hmm. which uh, mm -hmm. I won't get into so as not to spoil it. Um, yeah. Was a, was too like fantastical mm -hmm. science fictional fantasy, you know the ethical questions didn't really make sense to me. Like, and it just it, it ended yeah. up being a mismatch. Like, it didn't have a level of depth and realism and so on to mm -hmm. pair with what was happening yeah. on the individual yeah. character. The level. interpersonal level had deep realism and the sort of global, right. grander and, scale, like... Was, right. And I yeah, feel like that's anybody. where I struggle with my own science fiction. And I do sort of okay with short stories, but as you know, I've been trying to write a sci-fi novel for many yeah. years now. And I, I, keep, I think I'm getting closer and closer, but I, I'm, I think it's very difficult to make those two things work well, well, I'll tell you a rule of thumb I have. I have a really mm -hmm. practical rule of thumb that I think I invented. I don't know, but I believe I invented. If I ever uh, get to teach a clarion, I'm going to teach it, which is because I think this is a very useful rule. And I don't know if it answers your, helps at all with your question, but it, okay. you reminded me of it, um, particularly when you were like this mismatch. Because I think often what happens is we have one of the reasons that I, 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 I watching older shows or like early Star Trek or something, and you're like, they are flying around the galaxy at faster than light and they still have all these social mores of the 60s for instance yeah. or or you know or or like not even that or just like they seem to only live 70 years you know what i mean yeah. like they have like they like like everybody seems to be about the age that they would be and they seem to expect to like you know be dead by 100 even though they literally have like i don't know talking robot you know they have data right, right, right. but like apparently if you get sick you die you know what i mean like i don't know um we don't see any 300 year old people walking around mm -hmm. at least they don't tell us um and and similar things you know and it's sort of like you, you get the sort of flintstones version of his you know what i mean version of right. history where it's like there was always like dad comes home from work even in yeah. the stone age or um um actually somebody just i just saw on on the internet some meme about how the Flintstones, Flintstones is actually set at the same time as the Jetsons and the Flintstones is like it's, it makes perfect sense that Flintstones is like the post-apocalyptic like that's the working <laughs> class in the like that the, the, the rich have fled to their cloud cities and right, right. Fred is down there in the quarry anyway so um you're, you're killing me right because you like promised me this oh yes that's I gonna promised solve you a all thing. my problems okay. now you're going I'm, off and talking is, about the Flintstones is, and the Jetsons sorry <laughs> here is my holy grail but it's relevant because you were trying to avoid the Flintstones problem, right all right which is taking your social norms and transporting yeah, yeah. them to some yeah, other yeah, era yeah, of history. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, here's my rule of thumb. I, I don't think this is necessarily true, but it's about what reader readerly expectations. If a thing, a technology, uh, an institution, a social norm, is X years old at the time that I am writing the book, mm -hmm. I believe that the reader's intuitive perception, intuitive baseline assumption, if I don't specifically justify something else is that it will persist x years into the future okay so we are we are you, the reader sort of it's sort of it's sort of related to the principle of mediocrity the reader assumes that they are roughly in the center of history okay. so bread if you have three thousand years in the future and someone is cooking bread i don't really have a problem with that because yeah. bread is three thousand years old like i expect bread to persist for three thousand years if you have 3,000 years in the future, and someone is typing, you know, using a mouse right. to, to manipulate a pointer on a screen, I find that a little sketchy. Like, 3,000 years? Like, a mouse? Like, really? Like, Xerox Labs hit it so out of the park that the mouse moving a pointer on the screen is going to last... I mean, maybe. It could. I mean, there's but, like, a it's, certain... a, it's, a, it's a bit of a bet, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would, I would say this has to be modulated by how good the technology is. Like, you know, like sure. we had scrolls on parchment for a while, and then we had books and the printing press, and like then that sure. was a really good tech, and that it is lasted I know. for a long time, right? No doubt, and 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 you realize what what I'm saying? It can't be true in general because yeah. there wouldn't ever be anything, right? I mean, it can't yeah, be true. Yeah, in general. There's yeah, always yeah. a first. Any any technology that's going to last a thousand years, there was a first day it was invented, and then it definitely wasn't true that it would only live another day, right? Like right. what I'm saying is about reader life because it's not actually about how, but it is sort of it is true in a sense that when you say mouse mice computer mouses they're really good they're gonna last you are essentially like a, a like a very speculative investor 
Right. Like you could think of it as like, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's sort of like, it's like the bread is a blue chip. Like bread yeah, has been yeah. paying dividends for 3000 years. <laughs> the mouse, that's just law. That just went yeah, IPO. Yeah. Like you can put all your money in the mouse, but yeah. like, it's if you're buying a stock option on the mouse on the stock of mouse to be there in 3000 years. I mean, it's a risk. Keep that. So that's my point. People have this expectation, and you could do that with anything, like any, like social norms, right? Like, mm -hmm. like I don't know, like, like you know, like marriage, like the yeah. way marriage, lo like if if marriage, if you're writing something said 50 years in the future, and marriage, marriage should marriage 50 years in the future should feel about as different from marriage now as marriage, you know, in 1960. You know what I mean? Like it should yeah, be about yeah. that amount of gap. And right. that's what, and it's, you know, when you, see, when you see something written 500 years in the future and the social norms are just like ours today, like yeah. there are, you know, people are complaining about their bosses and then going home to their, you know, and their, and their it, it wives are trying a, to find a babysitter. Yeah. You're yeah. a little like, really? Because in 1600, that wasn't the case. Right. You know what I mean? But, yeah, yeah. And, that, and that gives you this great rule of thumb, I feel like, where you can be like, because obviously you can't make everything different, mm -hmm. but there's a way in which you can be like, okay, the things that are, the things if, I, if I'm writing very, you know, and, and so in a way, if you're writing very far in the future, it's like, well, I get to spin all the dials, you yeah. know, and, and you have to think about what dials are to spin. Obviously, that's, you know, there, there's some level where if you get far enough out in the future, because I've written, all, I've written things that are millions and billions of you years. You have, ago, yeah. And at that point, you begin to, like, you can no longer be writing in the same kind of coherent, realistic style. But the thing that I have found to do in those cases is you explicitly let the reader in on the idea that to some extent this is metaphor. Like, let's call it a ship. Let's call him the captain. Yeah. Like, of course that's not what we're talking about. Right, right, there are no right. captains of ships 15 yeah. million years from now. But let's use that metaphor so that you and I right. can talk about this thing that's happening, right? It. You know, and so there's that. There's that effort of translation. Like, we're, 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 we're translating. Mm -hmm. But I think that in, you know, in, 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 I still that they think that rule in some level still applies. Like there, you're calling attention to sort of that you're translating some things, but still, it's sort of like you're like, and it and so it what what's great about this is it uses it makes history this wonderful backstop where if I you know it suddenly Shakespeare becomes a really useful metaphor for a really useful mine of information for how I should talk about. Let's see. How many years is that? Like so, you're right. That was what like 400 years ago, right? So 2400 mm -hmm. should feel like Shakespeare. Right. You know, when I was writing a bunch of stuff set in, set in, uh, you know, the the guy who worked for the guy who works worked for money and and falling. I read a bunch of stories written in like 2050s Frankfurt, mm -hmm. and sort of after 2033, they default on the dollar. Money goes away. There's this whole new economy, and that that's the whole the whole premise of the thing. And I would start. I was when I was writing, I was thinking a lot about 1960. Like 1960 yeah. was as far away. So I was like, what has changed since 19? What can we reasonably say? What's the same since 1960? What has really changed? It should be that far away, you know. And that 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 thinking about social norms, thinking about you know, uh, you know, it's I think like it's a, I think it's a good principle. I I, I will I'll have to anyway. ponder it a little bit, but I yeah. like it as a guideline. It I do you know I think it's it's like when I give rules to my students, they immediately try to break them, right? Which is good. Yes. That's what they should you do. Should so definitely break you know, them. and so I'm thinking about like, well, what are the exceptions to this? And I'm like, well. You know, what about singularity type events where everything changes radically, you know, in ways that you wouldn't have anticipated and so, but I'm going to put all right, that but aside. I mean, we, but yeah. I mean, I mean, but I mean, yes, but oh, sure. But I guess, I, I guess I'm not saying make everything, I'm not saying make history smooth. Yeah, I'm yeah. saying the baseline expectation is, yeah, yeah. so in a way it's like author points. You have a certain number of points to spend. If you want to say, if you want the story, if you want to have a mouse in 3,000 yeah. years you're gonna have to sort of spend a little of the reader's attention to be like turned out mouse is a great technology you know what i mean or if you want to have well, it and, it's, it's, and i think i think one of the ways i've been dealing with it in my books mm -hmm. in my stories is um what are the things that interrupt the progression of tech right so mm -hmm. you know there's there was a hundred years of war and that mm -hmm. threw that stalled right. things threw things back etc or yeah we're sure. trying to terraform another planet and we've only got a couple hundred people that's gonna right change everything it's going to slow everything down maybe think people will get rigid about you know social roles or whatever because we're now in a survival setting um or we're on another planet and we've encountered aliens and they have now thrown a whole bunch of new stuff at us that mm -hmm. we wouldn't have evolved on our own so and how is but that i'm, I'm also not when i talk about this symmetry i'm not talking about yeah. a wiggish march of progress yeah, of like yeah, we were no. that much worse before i'm actually talking about strangeness i'm talking about alienation yeah. i'm talking about 
if you really think about 1500, it's very alienating, sure, you know, sure, sure. and, and, and is your, is your, the, the benchmark of like, are you doing a good job of writing in the far future? I feel like at least if you're playing this particular game, because it doesn't have to be, you could use, a, use a, a simulated, I think to some extent, the reason I, how I learned to stop worrying and love Star Trek was to stop expecting it to play my game, yeah. like to stop expecting it to, to do what I wanted it to do. Like, okay, this is a setting. There's a yeah. setting of space. And there's some really interesting character and philosophical dramas that they've decided for some reason to set on a spaceship. Like, as opposed to, you know, and some Star Trek does better than others in meeting my original metric. But I'm not yeah. saying this is the only game to play. But a game I like to play is, is it this much estranging? And, you know, there have been disasters. I mean, we had, there was, there, there have been times in, you know, the Roman Empire was very connected. And then after that, it, it Europe was split up into a lot of little yeah. fiefdoms for a while. And, you know, it, it's and not I think, like... I, I guess I would say you what you do, I think your mind naturally does that better than mine, right? Like my impulse is mm -hmm. to essentially do what Star Trek does. What I think, I think Bujold is in the same, this whole space opera genre, Interestingly, perhaps. Bujold doesn't trigger me that way, but yeah, anyway, go yeah, on. Well, I, the, Bujold, but, I don't know. Well, it's, yeah, it's different. I mean, yeah. I agree that she's not playing quite the same game, but I think that she's making a certain, and I think you often, I, I guess I'm I'm closer to Bajol in some it. ways, but but it's that yeah. that same kind of like I just want to take these issues, this set of concerns. Yeah. I want to yeah. write, yeah. you know, like I have that story plea that's uh, it's up on Lightspeed, guys. You can go read it; it's free. Um, <laughs> and it was, you know, that story was the intersection of the Syrian refugee crisis being in the mm -hmm. news. I'd be listening to it on on NPR as I was driving into campus and crying because it was just so terrible right mm -hmm. and at the same time my son had started kindergarten and was getting hauled into uh the office constantly he had like 17 uh incidents in the first year um which turned out to basically be because of adhd he has a really hard mm -hmm. time standing still especially in line so he'd be like bumping mm, into other yeah. kids that was taken as aggression and yeah. um and and so all of my anxieties about him and as a mixed race kid i'm brown he's mm -hmm. light brown right and then hearing people talking about the syrian refugees and whether we should let them into the country and well it's okay to let in women and kids but not young men because there hmm. might be terrorists all of that kind of coalesced into a set of anxieties around who gets to decide who is too violent to yeah come to refuge right and yeah the and how is that how is that differently uh, applied to brown boys and i mm -hmm. you know so i write the story about space whales and you know telepathic uh -huh. space whales and um this lesbian couple with kids and it's actually a little girl who has a violent thought and the my point here i guess is that i i could have written essentially the same story realistically right so mm -hmm. I don't know that I did any of the kind of thing you're talking about in terms of uh, extrapolating strangeness, whatever, like that wasn't my project. That wasn't what mm -hmm. I was interested in doing. I, I wanted to not trigger people's, as you say, like, I don't want to throw them out of the story. So I want to do yeah. a, a minimum level of world building for plausibility. Um, yeah. But what I was really interested in was talking about this issue using the cognitive estrangement of science fiction to be yeah. able to talk about the issue without triggering people's preconceptions about the Syrian refugee crisis, yeah. right? But I don't, but I don't think that that's so different. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I maybe talk, and now, I think now I talked about it in a sort of an extreme way where mm -hmm. I'm sort of like, you have to figure out every, if they use a fork, <laughs> you have to think about whether the fork, but I mean, that's, that's sort of like, I'm geeking out about all the details, but I think that cognitive estrangement is sort of rooted in the same idea that you're saying enough here is different that you can let yeah. go you know you can you can engage with this theme because i'm placing you somewhere i'm taking you on a holiday so it's right. not syria it's not earth it's not and 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 you know and, and, and the amount that you have to do of the sort of like in a in a story that's full of like eyeball kick gimmick um wacky science fictional speculation you have to do a lot of it because you foreground to the reader that you're going to do a lot of it but in a story like that i mean like yeah. i mean i love Le Guin, and Le Guin is not full of like this right. device is you know but that's well, and, um, and I, would, I would say i actually think i could push myself more on that right like yeah. when i 
when I bring stuff to you and, and David Moles to critique, I, one of the things that I like about having you look at, at my work is that you start extrapolating all this stuff yeah. that I would not, I would not think to make weirder and stranger. And, yeah. and it's not the way my mind naturally goes. It's not my, I have to really work at it. Um, and but I think it's a question, does it serve the story? You know, you don't need to make it, weirder and, weirder, weirder and stranger is not a goal in and of itself. No, but it usually, if you, I think if I put in a little more, it, it would, it would make it better. Yeah. It, it would, cause yeah. it would, it would, it would do the work of cognitive estrangement more effectively, right? Yeah, so. I think, I think that, I think, and I, yeah, I mean, I think there's, I think there's, I don't mean, I don't want to be taken as saying, you know, I don't mean to, I don't mean to leave our listeners if there are any with, <laughs> with, with if more we, than if two, we end up shipping this one in, yeah. yes so. um, i don't want to leave anyone with the, with with the idea that you that this is a this is that this is this rule that you have to put on this attention on making things sufficiently strange i think there's a kind of science fiction that revels in strangeness and there's a kind of science fiction that uses a little bit of strangeness to pry people away from their everyday concerns in order to deliver some other payload but i think that the you only need as much as you need you know what I mean? So, so again, it's what you call your reader's attention to. Many science fiction stories that I love are very spare with the amount of detail that we get. They're essentially fables, you know, yeah. and, and that is very effective, but you don't need more. What happens is if you say to the reader, oh, look, yeah. here's a thing, you know, then, then you, then you, then you, you know, then you've called your shot, right? Then you've yeah, said, yeah. I'm going to put the ball in this pocket, you know? Yeah. And so, and so, yeah. So you have to. Um, so so the the rule about about thinking how strange is this is a rule you only the, the corollary to that is you only need to deploy that when you're actually a when you're surfacing to your reader's attention that something is away about this world. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if you're and 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 you know and. Yeah, and some of the time you can say, you know, uh, some of the time it's it's okay for a certain amount of things to be like surprisingly this persisted. You yeah. know what I mean? And every reader's gonna have their own idiosyncratic reaction. But I I think it is about the, you know, it is it is just about sort of operationalizing the strangeness in cog cognitive estrangement. All right, we I should think wrap we should, up pretty we should soon. wrap. I think I, I don't so, know. So yeah, how do we how do we wrap far. and what's our next uh Well, I don't think we, I don't think we got very far with the titling thing, <laughs> but um, That's going to be the theme of the podcast is that like every episode we try to title the podcast and fail. <laughs> yeah, so we at some point have to come up with something. Well, so. we'll, we'll, we'll have to like we'll have to we'll, like record 13 episodes in <laughs> secret and then like, by the final episode of the season we'll come up cool. with the name and we'll then retroactively apply it. Apply it.